what I'm finding fascinating, how many people were here last year? Can I just see, what? right, quite a few. Already we've seen more references to technology in the first two speakers than we saw last year, isn't that right? It's amazing how much technology is impacting at the same rate as us understanding the brain and plasticity, so too is technology becoming a bigger part of our lives, our learnings and our emotions. So um, I'd like to bring on to the stage the, our last speaker before morning tea, um, and she's our third speaker in the area of our human potential, and it's Professor Erica McWilliam, who I just met this morning, and she's a, a, an amazing woman. She's an adjunct professor at the ARC Centre of Excellence for Creative Industries and Innovation, which is at the Queensland University of Technology. So she began as a teacher, and she taught for 20 years in some of the toughest schools in Queensland, and then she went on to teacher education. Um, she's now an internationally recognised scholar with a particular focus on workforce, workforce preparation of youth in post-compulsory schooling and in higher education. So basically, she's a writer and speaker on learning in the 21st century and how we can support it, which is, I don't think that there is any topic that is probably more important uh, than that. Uh, she's also performed professional du duties as an educational researcher at the National Institute of Education in Singapore. She's got great stories about that and has recently worked as at uh, Brisbane's Girls Grammar School as a scholar in residence, which would be a great job, I reckon. Um, Erica's research and scholarship continues to be well known for its focus on low threat, high challenge teaching in and for the 21st century. Her latest book, which is, will be available at the bookshop, uh, The Creative Workforce, How to Launch Young People into High Flying Futures, is available um, today and every day. Um, today she's going to be speaking about how young people need less therapy and more challenge. So please uh, welcome Professor Erica McWilliam to the stage. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, I've been thinking about the issue, as I do as a teacher, of nouns and adjectives and thinking about mental as the adjective that's derived from the notion of mind noun. And I think for myself, even though mental, of course, has a lot of connotations, mental as anything, going completely mental, I'm thinking about how many baby boomers there are here, so I can't see, but you might remember that we had a thing in school called mental. You remember mental? Mental about hands on heads. A boy has four and a half dozen marbles. He loses a third of them, four and a half dozen, a, a quarter of what he has left, he gives to his sister. How many does he have left? Answers down, hands away. Now, I can remember these things. The answer, who got the answer? <laughs> come on, come on. We'll get him later. Th that, that was mental, and you'd get about ten of them early in the morning. And it means that you needed a Bex and a good lie down by morning tea. <laughs> Who can remember a Bex now? <laughs> yeah, see, baby boomers, all of you people um, who need to know what a Bex is, just go and find a baby boomer. <laughs> of course, we didn't do drugs in, in Australia in the 50s. Uh, we, and Lord knows that Bex was just the housewife's friend. <laughs> take, take a few of those and be bouncing off the walls by morning tea. So my memory is mental, and my memory is that mental was difficult. And the point of, me of, of doing it was to get that brain going. But my interest now is in the fact, uh, and my concern now, is that we tend to um, go to a situation where we've decided, so I'll just get that right, that, that we are no longer going to ask young people to do things that are too difficult. We are in retreat from difficulty, and we're in retreat because, and I think particularly, we worry about whether difficulty is going to lower kids' self-esteem. I think we've been on a collision course for some time. And a real problem now, you've been hearing Susan, you've been hearing Evian talk about that necessity of engaging with complexity and the importance of the way in which we, pr we, we engage with complexity. We stay in the grey, and yet here we are, moving away. Um, Michael Foley's book, 
uh, and of course we could think of him as a bit of an old curmudgeon, perhaps that's true, like Nicholas Carr, the shallows, but nevertheless, his notion that difficulties become repugnant, he says, because it denies entitlement, it disenchants potential, it limits mobility and flexibility, delays gratification, we can't have that, distracts from distraction, demands responsibility, commitment, attention and thought. I was in a classroom recently where there was a teacher who had a boy on the floor there uh, writing. He wasn't writing very well because he's writing on a floor a bit like the one your, is under your feet. Writing on carpet isn't a very good idea. It's not what we do. And the pen, pencil was going through the paper, really, and, and mucking it all up. I said to her, how's the writing going? She said, well, it's not going very well because she said, um, you know, I said, well, it wouldn't be. I mean, he's on the floor. She said, no, well, no. But she said, he was actually quite a good writer when he came. I said, <laughs> I said, right, W-R-I-T-E. And I said, so why is it? She said, he likes being on the floor. I said, but when we write, we sit in a chair. That's what you do. I mean, it's not a tyranny, you know. It's not a form of terrorism <laughs> to sit on the chair. No, no, he said, he, he likes to be on the floor. I said, oh, what do you think your job is in relation to him? She said, to keep him happy. No, no. And my concern increasingly is that a, a, a whole notion among stu my student teachers particularly, that their job is basically to be a therapist. It is to be caring and concerned. It is to wheedle the soul out of kids. It's to say things like, Jason, I can see you're angry. I can see, I can see your anger. <laughs> I've got a friend, she cannot bear not to do therapy. She's a great person. But when I see her, I say uh, to her, hello, Esme. She says, hello, Erica, how are you? And I say, I'm great. She says, how are you really? <laughs> now, she's, she's an English teacher, and she, she can't help herself. And I say, I'm fine, thanks. She says, hey, it's me, OK? <laughs> now, so we, so we can get into a, a thing there. And then I ask my student teachers, what do you need to know about somebody to teach them? They say, everything. Oh, you have to know everything. You have to know, you know, if there's been lack of oxygen to the brain during birth, because you could get, you know, and if, you have to know, if the father's been alcoholic, and they've got it all worked out. I said, why don't you just teach them some maths would be good? <laughs> you, know, you don't necessarily need to know what their grandmother died of to teach them some maths. So, so I'm, I'm becoming increasingly ambivalent about the rush to save kids in ways that they don't want to be saved. And I know that a lot of working class boys in Australia in particular are completely flummoxed when they're given anger management. They'd actually probably rather have the cane and get back out to footy. <laughs> they're not particularly thrilled about wheedling. They try and cough up what they think the person wants here, but um, it is increasingly, I think, a problem about what is it that we're doing. To me, the, great, the calling here is to, is to help young people access the pleasure of the rigour of the work the pleasure of the rigour of learning both. Not just have fun with maths, not just have fun sitting on the floor with a designer drink bottle, but the, the pleasure of the rigour of the thinking. So I've got a particular beef about that, and I think that the issue here about the rejection of difficulty, there is some evidence, it's not uh, the sort of evidence that Susan showed you earlier, but there is a question of the fact that the world's supply of oranges is in decline because we can't bother to peel them. Kids can't be bothered to peel them, certainly Australian kids can't be bothered to peel them, unless mum can actually cut them up and put them in a thing, you know, and, and in a, a hermetically sealed whatever, and get the pips out, etc. <laughs> now, um, what's interesting, when I, was in, when I was in Beijing not long ago, I said to them, what made you so successful in terms of the world diaspora when they went out to become prosperous all over the world, the Chinese? They said, because we could, we could sleep anywhere and eat anything. We could sleep anywhere and eat anything. We could tolerate discomfort. Our children cannot peel an orange because it makes their fingers too sticky. And I've told, I was told that by a principal recently at a school. Too hard, just too hard. We're rejecting, easy, uh, rejecting difficulty in other ways. Kids are opting out of high-end maths and science uh, rather do things like media studies or, or life skills. Now, I'm nothing against life skills. Some of our academics could do well to have some. <laughs> But, but nevertheless, the issue here is the, the pleasure of the rigour. Not just have fun, the pleasure of the rigour. And school guidance officers now haven't seen people who got their first B. And they're telling me they're seeing a lot more of those. I've only got a B. And the parents are up in arms because they did half the assignment. So, <laughs> they, so they're outraged. 
<laughs> they're outraged. And so we have a whole problem about this. Recently, a friend of mine who had, took some students, he said to them, do you get wetter standing in the rain or walking in the rain? He said, that's your, uh, that's your exercise for the next three weeks. I want you to come up with an experiment. I want you to think about it. I want you to come up with a, with a theory. And went and sat at the back of the room. Well, throws young people, particularly, uh, particularly high achievers, who said, tell us the answer, sir, and we will learn it. That's it. Tell us the answer. We're here. We've got the pen ready, ready to go. No, he said, come up with a theory. Well, of course, what happens then? They rush home. Parents thrown to complete disarray. <laughs> Mothers on the internet at 2 a.m. desperate to find the answer. Because the kids got to achieve, otherwise they might get their first B. Can't go there. So there are serious issues here, and there's a serious issue too about teachers being under pressure to get high results. So teachers say, well, I'll, I've given him an A minus minus. Because <laughs> it's not, you know, but I just don't, you know. So there's, and of course, a lot of effort going into being angry about the result, uh, which we might have gone better into the front end where we're actually doing the assignment would have been a good idea. So I think there is an issue for us here, um, and that the issue is that this is not the way the world is going. When you look at what the problems are, I mean, here we are, you know, if I hear Greece another time, uh, I'm sure that people in Greece feel a little bit more stressed about it than I do still. But when we look at what the problems are, we have solved the easy problems. I mean, 20th century, we've solved a lot of the easy problems. We are leaving our young people with the hardest problems, with the most difficult ones. If they don't have the capacity to think, and if they can't think about their thinking, then they're going to be in real trouble when it comes to solving these things, because it's not getting easier. The space between their, what they know and the technology here, I mean, for me, the issue is we're not getting more knowledgeable, we're becoming more ignorant. The point is to be usefully ignorant with these things. If anything goes out now, if all the lights go off or something happens with this thing, I don't have capacity to fix this. Our great-grandparents could fix anything in their environment. If, if the lamp was smoking, they could stop it smoking. If the butter churn didn't churn, they could make it churn. We can't do that now. So we have to actually be able to protect our capacity to think because knowing what to do when you don't know what to do is the fundamental learning disposition of the 21st century. Write it down. <laughs> it's just the old teacher in me, I can't help. Uh, but knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And a lot of our highest achievers may not be our best learners because they know what to do when you tell them what to do. Now, that's not where we're going if we're going back to this, if we're going to try and deal with these things. What we have, unfortunately, is increasingly, tell me I'm wonderful and give me an A. And that issue, I'm sorry for this kid, he's probably a very nice kid, it's a dreadful photo, and I'm sure his mother would want to take to me with an axe. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, that indiscriminately promoting self-esteem. And I know a lot of student teachers say to me, well, their job really is to raise self-esteem and help kids reach their full potential. And they say it as a sort of a mantra. Raise self-esteem and help them reach their full potential. I said, well, maybe the raising self-esteem, maybe kids could have self-esteem that's too high. I mean, people uh, whose self-esteem are too high are more likely to hurt you. Let people know that. If they've got very high self-esteem. And we get very excited about the idea of self-esteem. And we think everybody should have buckets of it. But the, the point here is that when it becomes detached from what people are actually doing, we say, just for being you, darling, you're marvellous. So we get into a class and we say, what do you think? What's your opinion? And we have students who say, I just reckon that Shakespeare's just a load of crap. We say, yeah, uh-huh, right, right. Oh, that's interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not interesting. It's not interesting. <laughs> right? It's dull. And I have students now in university who say to me, I just, um, I just feel really strongly about this. I say, what have you read? I, I don't know, it's, I just feel, I, I feel really strongly about that. <laughs> you might like to read something. <laughs> because, because you see, your opinion doesn't matter. <laughs> ah! <laughs> but, but what informs your opinion really matters. What informs you? Now, at the hairdressers, we're at the hairdressers, and someone says, you know, this is the way teaching should be, or this is what we should do, and another person disagrees, then that's up to them. That's fine, we're at the hairdressers. But when we're here learning, then, then your opinion, I want to know what's informed it. 
So I am fascinated by what has informed your opinion. That's what I want to hear about. And the difficulty we have now, and I have lovely student teachers with, with lovely kids, nice people, lovely people, very concerned about the students. I had one not long ago who said to one of our students in the class, do you have a biro? The kid said, yeah. She said, oh, great, no, great, great. <laughs> it's normal to have a biro, normal. Don't tell them it's great, it's not great. So, so, <laughs> so for me, the, the, the issue here is, what is it that kids are learning? Because you're learning, learning a sense of entitlement at the same time, we're not being usefully ignorant, it's uselessly ignorant. And I don't want that for young people. And so the question for me is, what does it mean to care about them? What does it mean to care about them? It means to build that capacity to think. We must protect their capacity to think and their capacity to learn. And that doesn't, is not the same as patronising. So I think there's been a collision course here. And we've seen the sage on the stage. We don't want that. We don't want the sage on the stage, all-knowing, and treats people like they came in on somebody's shoe. We don't want that. But the guide on the side thing, where we have teachers wandering around like Florence Nightingale, <laughs> handing out endless worksheets, or taking boxes, I mean, we have the SRA box, the hardest thing you do is carry the box to the room. But wandering around and, and looking at the students working and saying, that good, mm. now, just um, colour in the Roman helmet. Yep, yep, just colouring in there. Oh, uh, well. We've got to get on with it. But we don't want to upset people because it might lower their self-esteem. Now, the research is actually telling us that this is not really the way to go. We're actually finding out that there is a disconnect between self-worth and provable skill. And um, that's not the same. We, uh, building a sense of self-efficacy um, is, is not the same as just saying, tell them they're wonderful all the time for not doing anything. Right, but just being you, darling, just being you, hey? Okay, it's, it's fine for mothers, every painting is a Leonardo, I've got no problem. When it goes on the fridge, terrific, that's great. But I do have a problem with not yet, and, and, and the, the idea that we've got to give, have instant success. I've been in fantastic school, including the, the wonderful school that I'm, that I'm still associated with. But I see young people who want it to be perfect and instant and now. And they sort of feel that they're promised that. Let's not get into the grey of not yet and not knowing. Perfect instant now. Tell me it's terrific. Right? And we have a nervous breakdown if we don't. So, we've got to get past this. We know now that the research messages are telling us that we've got to do better. We've got to be able to push on from just the, the notion of tell them they're wonderful. And we, we, we need to go forward now to not yet. And I think that to, if we care about young people and their capacity to handle those problems we have there, we're going to actually ask them to do more thinking. And we're not going to simply patronise them. They're better than that. They are better than that. So, it's true also for the spaces that we have. I think it's interesting to look at John Medina's work. He says, uh, basically, if you want to create an education environment that was directly opposed to what the brain is good at, you'd probably design something like a classroom. And if you want to create an environment in which uh, people would work most efficiently uh, in business, you probably wouldn't design a cubicle. But we have gone there, and now what's very interesting, I think, is to get back into the space of lifelong learning, not sentencing learners to life, <laughs> lifelong learning, the origin of which is the cafe, not the school. Repeat after me. So, uh, right. The cafe, not the school. It was in the cafe that people came to pay their penny, and it was in the cafe where they mixed baronets and bootmakers. It was in the cafe where, I, uh, where Isaac Newton carved up the first dolphin. It was in the cafe where people came to be ongoing learners, not the school. Not the school. The school was for mandated learning where people were going to finish and go. Now, increasingly, we've got to look at our learning environments and say, how much do they replicate and uh, give us the sense of that, that cafe learning? The way in which people gathered around, where they meddled in the middle is my term, but what they had was they gathered around tables and they shared resources. They shared coffee. They even had coffee squirting up the legs of tables. We've lost that now. <laughs> health and safety, health and safety. <laughs> So, can't do anything because of health and safety. We know we have a new learning environment and we know that um, 
this is increasingly pushing and pulling, and one of the big issues we're going to be talking about here is what's, what does this mean in terms of thinking? Is it shutting it down? Is it opening it up? Is it about a great cultural exuberance, uh, or is it uh, causing us to, to shrink what it is that we, we might be investing in? Does it make things too easy? Um, what do we want to say about it? Now, I think that there are <clears throat> there's no doubt about whatever we're doing here with this, it is changing the way we read and write. And one of the things we know it's doing is it's shifting us from input to output. The pen and the paper shifts us, uh, when, we, when we look at the internet, shifts us to what the products are. So we can get into a sort of thing that Michael Heim calls spewing, unfortunately. There you go. It's very Australian. It sounds Australian. He was Austrian, actually, so it's close. Uh, <laughs> he, he says, you know, that we had to think before you write in paper and pencil times, right? But with the internet, and a lot of people, a lot of us do this now, you spew it out there, just throw it out there, and then fiddle and poke with it. You know, take that bit out, that's no good. So it can look pretty quick, quickly pretty good. So everybody thinks they've got a book in them. A friend of mine in creative industry says, I want an x-ray machine to put it up next to people and say, no, you haven't got a book in you. It would be very nice, though, to, to think about, you know, how, do we, how would we deal with that? So there are a lot of things that are changing, and that issue that was raised about interruption, that what we've got now is a culture of interruption and distractibility. And one of the things that we have to do in learning, whether we're parents, whether we're teachers, wh whatever we're doing, we need to think about how do we help people go through um, a, an ecology of interruption and distractibility. So this is our, a, a, big, a big challenge. You can't do it by being Florence Nightingale wandering from table to table and telling kids how wonderful they are. What you need to do then is to think again about a much more proactive engagement with learners. And it doesn't mean we go back to control and command, but it means that we go forward to support and direct. So we need teachers up off their tails, we need them getting in there, and we need them to help model what it means to both be knowledgeable and usefully ignorant. We need both of those now. The old sage on the stage was just knowledgeable. I remember I had a teacher who was, well, I was just training who was called Darcy Rogers. He was knowledgeable. The first day, first class, he would walk in and say, the name's Rogers, the subject's science, the method's force. <laughs> and it, it was, it was, method was force. Um, so we all got with it pretty quickly. Uh, and, and of course, it's very crisp. There's something about fascism, isn't there? Crisp, <laughs> it's crisp. As Chris, but, but now, of course, we, we, I'm thinking, how, what are we to do about that? Now, if we, if, if we are only investing in self-esteem no matter what, you're wonderful, you're marvellous, you're fabulous, then we get to the problem about what do we do with challenge. And I think what we've done is moving from, if you like, high threat of the sage on the stage, high threat, but perhaps high challenge, hopefully, good, with, good, with good, uh, good but punitive teachers. You can, that's a bit of a strange oxymoron. Um, that if we then move to, to a sort of wandering gypsy teacher with everyone's colouring in and lying on the floor, we go to the guide on the side is sort of flabbied out so, so that everybody's being protected and given an A minus, minus, minus. Uh, then we might move, think in terms of what we can do with low threat and high challenge, which is what I'm very much interested in and which we, we need to go. We've got to finish with a therapeutic moment and get on, because this is too complex a world to let kids lie on the floor and let their writing regress and tell them that they're wonderful and they don't have to do anything. So my interest is in high challenge learning. We might try then to think about how we do this. Some crucial issues here is that we, we have statements that cause thinking, that kids practice how to design tests, not just doing them. So right at the beginning when I gave you that test, the answer to the mental that you got at the beginning? 27. 27, close, very close. Um, that, to get that uh, feeling, I'd be asking kids, if 27's the answer, what's the question? And that should be on the end of the maths exam. Uh, not just correct answers, correct answers. We want our kids to, yes, we want correct answers, but we've got to have better questions. They've got to be asking better qu questions. And so there's no reason why, at the end of a paper, we couldn't just have at the bottom, if the answer's uh, 27, what's the question? One, if they said nine times three, they get one out of five. That gets the high achievers sitting up, I can tell you. 
Well, three cubed, two out of five. Ooh, ooh. Let's look for five processes. What can we do? Now, that's what we want, open-ended complexity. That's what we need to be building here. That's the high challenge. And we, we certainly won't get it if we're looking only for correct answers, only for standardised tests. If we're shutting down options, we don't just want to go back to a time when we said correctness, correctness, and a limited repertoire. But what we need to open up is, yes, correctness, but also better questions and the kids asking them. Kids need to work harder than teachers, uh, and we need to get less therapy, less entitlement, and more challenge. I, I said, I love the kids that I taught, but they're not let off the hook of challenge. Obligatory engagement, no opting out, no arms folded, no, what do I care, no mucking about, on we go. So uh, the issue for me then is that we've got a real challenge about what we might do. And in these cases, we've got to start to respect the kids enough to require things of them and respect ourselves enough. We've got to be co-learners with them as well. So we're looking at how we, we build those cultures. It's time. It's time, in fact, it's, it's well overdue. Otherwise, what we do is we, we give kids to understand that they will have instant success, they can have a perfect answer, they'll get an A+, plus, and they can lie on the floor and do very little indeed. Now, this is not the world in which they can do that. To me, it's not about getting rid of, of pleasure. It's not about uh, expunging the pleasure of learning. It's certainly not going back to sage on the stage. But we need to go forward to meddler in the middle. And meddler in the middle is, is the, the, the identity for, for, for teaching and for learning with learners, which will give us a chance to be practical, pragmatic. It helps young people to understand about staying in the grey of not yet, not yet, not perfect and instant. Computer might suggest that that's what they're going to get. We've got to help them stay in the grey. That's quite difficult to do uh, for people who do want to be told they're wonderful. Now, of course, our kids are wonderful, but they also have a, a hard road to hoe, a complex world. Uh, let's try and help them, as I suggest, with, with a little less therapy and much more challenge. Thank you. <laughs>